This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I felt, felt I feel right. right. I was so and I just thought, well, I figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Jeffrey Schell. The story was recorded in July 2014 at the Frontier in Brunswick, Maine. So I was up before sunrise, excited for my day ahead and the adventures I had planned. I splashed some water in my face, ate a quick breakfast, grabbed my backpack, which I had prepared the night before. And of course, I couldn't forget my map. This was an awesome map, hand-drawn on the back of a napkin, and it was going to guide me to my destination, Playa Escondida, the hidden beach. The concierge at the small bed and breakfast I was staying at in Puerto Rico had drawn it for me. And he thought it would be the perfect place for me, given the job that I had. You see, I'm an oceanographer, and I work for Sea Education Association. We take students to sea. We teach him how to sail, and I teach him about the oceans and the different islands that we visit. And he thought, this is the perfect place for an oceanographer. So early in the morning, I'm driving through the quiet streets of Puerto Rico, and I'm imagining what I'm going to find at Playa Escondido. What kind of hidden treasures are going to be there? What am I going to find on this, what I believe to be, is going to be some undisturbed reef? The crazy critters I might find there. Unfortunately, Playa Escondido had a more sinister secret to reveal. I get to the, the more popular beach where the tourists are, and I walk past them. I go across the rocky shore, I'm following my map. I find the small hidden path through the trees. And I walk about 30 minutes through the mangroves, and I finally get to the shores of Playa Escondido. And of course, the oceanographer in me begins to sort of imagine what's going on in the water around me. I can see that I'm on the protected side of a rocky peninsula, so the northeast trade winds aren't mixing up the water, so I'm thinking that's going to be great for snorkeling. And I look at the watercolor, and I see the different shades of blue, and I was like, all right, there's the deep channel, right? And those muted colors of green and brown over there, right? That might be coral reef patches, seagrass over there. And I'm thinking, all right, this would be a great place for snorkeling. But over there in the distance, I'm seeing that there is a northwest swell rolling in. And I can see the telltale signs of it, this white water breaking. There must be a fringing reef further offshore. And I can see this swell rolling in, breaking on that reef. And that water is pouring into the shallows. And I know that's going to really kind of ruin the visibility uh, in this place. But I was like, no matter. I look down along the beach, and I see that below the high tide line in the wet sand, there's not a single footprint. I've got this beach to myself. So I grow further on down the beach. I find myself a shady spot. I pull out my snorkeling equipment and I hop in the water. And I'm snorkeling around. And just like I had suspected, right, I found the, the patch reefs and the seagrass beds. But also, as I could tell, that swell had really stirred things up. I didn't see much more than a few urchins and some brightly colored sea stars. But really, there wasn't much else to see. So I was sort of pulling myself out of the water. A big group had shown up. A family had found this secluded beach. There were parents and relatives, sons and daughters, Friends and cousins, who knows? It was a big group, and they're all carrying umbrellas and coolers. And as I was getting out of the water, I noticed that actually some of the small children had already gotten in the water with masks on. And I thought to myself, well, they're going to be a little disappointed, right? The visibility isn't all that great. So I go down to my end of the beach and pull out a book and start enjoying it. And a few bird watchers walk by, and they've got their khaki pants on and their wide-brimmed hats and binoculars around their necks. And we exchanged polite good mornings in English, to my surprise. And then uh, they continue on their way, and we pretend that we've got some part of this secluded beach to ourselves. 
And I look over and I see that the, the children, they've already given up on their snorkeling. And they seem to be swimming further and further uh, out to sea. And I was like, are they going to try to like, body surf in those waves out there? They just look so confused. I didn't get it. Uh, and then I go and uh, start collecting some shells around my, my site. And I'd gathered a nice little handful of shells. I was pretty proud of myself. And then I look out and I see that those three children now, I could tell there's three of them and they're really out there in those waves. And I was like, are they playing in those waves? I just can't imagine. The seas just look so confused. And I was looking a little closer and then I noticed that they're not swimming out toward the waves. They're actually trying to swim back to shore and it's not working. And then it dawned on me, they're stuck in a rip current. All the signs had been there. I just didn't see it before. The swell breaking in over the fringing reef, all that water piling up into the shallows, building up pressure, and that water has to go somewhere. And when it finds a deep channel, it rushes out. And that's what was happening. I could see it in the steep square waves. The water rushing out, the swell coming in, and the children stuck right in the middle of it. The first thing that came to my mind is, am I the only one who's seen this? What is going on? And then I heard it. Drifting across the sound of the waves was a girl's scream. Only now had the swimmers realized the danger that they were in. I started running, and my mind began racing. In the back of my head, a clock started ticking how long the swimmers been in the water. And then my training kicked in. For the work I do on the ship, we train for these kind of emergency situations, all sorts of types. And in every role I have is communications. Distribute the VHF radios, contact the Coast Guard, organize assets to try to help. But I had left my, my cell phone at home. I was in Puerto Rico. I didn't have cell service. I'm running down the beach. I see that the family has been alerted by the, the scream as well. They're on their feet. I see two boys jump in the water and start swimming out to their friends, perhaps to help their sister. And who wouldn't? It's a natural reaction to want to go and help. And all I could think of is, no, 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 don't go in the water. I know this story. I know how it can end. I was reminded of my graduate school mentor. He too had gone into the water to try to save his son from a rip current. And he died in the process. He had gone out there to help keep his son afloat, perhaps to help his son swim ashore. And he had succeeded in saving his son but he had died in the process. And that was in the back of my mind as I was running to the family. By the time I reached the group, I started yelling, has anyone called the police? Has anyone called the Coast Guard? They don't understand me in English. So in Spanish and in sign language and hand signals, I'm Nueve Uno Uno, Nueve Uno Uno, 911, we need to call for help now. Finally, the father understands me enough and he runs back to grab his phone. A clock is ticking in the back of my head. There are five swimmers in the water. The father returns with the phone. It's the Coast Guard. They want to speak to me. And in English, I tell them, we have five swimmers in the water They're stuck in a rip current. We need a boat. We need help now. I hand the phone back to the father as I see that the two boys have reached the other swimmers. And it looks like they're trying to help the girl swim to shore. And what are they doing? They're trying to swim back against the current. Don't they know what to do? You swim to the side. Swim left. Swim to the right. Get out of the current. But they were swimming. And they had started to make some progress but they were still fighting the current, and it looked like they were beginning to tire. So what do I do? I know they need to swim to the side. We're yelling and signaling from shore, all of us now. Everyone understands they need to swim to the side, but they can't hear us. We're too far away. Do I go out there like the two boys, like my mentor had? Do I take that risk? Or do I stand here and do nothing? I could go and grab my snorkel fins. Maybe that's going to help me in the water. But what if I'm wrong? As I struggle with this internal debate, my decision is made for me. I hear another scream from the girl, a sound I hope to never hear again in my life. In the mind of that girl, she was about to die. In the emotion that she felt, I could feel in the sound of her scream. The next thing I'm doing is I'm running down the beach again, back toward my site. Not to grab my fins, though. I know I can't risk swimming. Instead, I grab my shoes so I can try to wade across the shallows safely. I judge the look of the watercolor. I find a path that seems to be shallow enough to make my way so that I'm not in the current. 
but still close enough to try to signal to them, you've got to get out of that current. The clock is ticking. There are five swimmers still in the water. I start wading out to sea, and I hear a voice behind me. Hey, man, I wouldn't go out there unless you're a strong swimmer. And I turn around, and I see the pair of bird watchers. And one of them, he's had to skew his binoculars. He's throwing them off to the side in the sand. He, too, had been signaling to the children. And now he was confirming all of my doubts. But I didn't have time to answer him. I knew that if I had to swim with my shoes on now, I'd be lost. But I had no choice. I turned my back to shore and continued wading out into the water. I'm signaling the entire time, trying to get the attention of the children. And they still don't see me. The clock is ticking. There are still five swimmers in the water. The water is getting deeper and deeper. It's above my waist now, and I can start to feel the current around my legs. And still, the swimmers don't see me. They're looking directly towards shore, still fighting the current. They don't see me off to the side. I have to get closer. By the time I get to the edge of the shallow, I'm right at the edge of the current. I'm close enough now. They finally see me, and I see them. And there is a look of sheer terror on their faces. Their skin is so pale and white, and their eyes, their eyes were wild with fear. Their arms laboring, trying to stay afloat. Fear and adrenaline, only thing keeping them afloat. But they see me, and they start swimming toward me now across the current, finally, and they're getting closer. And I'm leaning out, trying to reach the first swimmer. And I'm leaning, and then I fall. And I slip, and I'm now in the current. And now I'm getting rushed out to sea. The, the terror that I saw in the faces of those children, I now felt course through my entire body. In panic and desperation, I kick and flail anything to try to reach the shallows, to grab an edge. I manage to hook a foot. I grab back with some, my left hand, and I grab some seagrass, and it holds. From this position, I can reach out, and I get the first arm of the first swimmer, and I recognize him. It's one of the boys who had gone out to save the girl. He's exhausted, and we both scramble up into the shallows together. And he can't stand on his own two feet. He collapses in my arms, and I look out, and I see that there's still four swimmers struggling in my way. What am I going to do? My hands literally are full. And then I hear a familiar voice behind me. Pass them to me and take this. And I turn around, and I see, my God, it's, it's that bird watcher. He's the, the one who had told me not to go out here, followed me anyways and he was carrying with him a long piece of driftwood, thank God. I pass him to the first boy and take the piece of driftwood and turn back to the swimmers. The next swimmer to reach us is the girl, and with the piece of driftwood, it's easy. She's able to grab a hold, and I'm able to pull her into the shallows. I have her in my arms, and I turn around, and who's with me now? The father has followed us out. I pass the girl back to the father, and he begins carrying her to shore. I take the driftwood. I see that there's another swimmer getting closer. He, too, is also one of the boys who had gone out to save the girl. And his face is like contorted in pure anguish. His eyes are beginning to glaze over. He can't even grab onto the stick. And in the end, I actually have to help him up into the shallows. And when I do, he completely collapses in my arms. I lose the driftwood. It's now drifting out to sea. And I follow that piece of driftwood, and I see that there are still two swimmers in the water. And the clock is ticking. But I notice that they had followed the lead. They, too, had begun swimming across the current. And they had found a patch of shallower water. They were just further out, and there was still a deep channel that separated us. But for now, they were safe from drowning. So I began to take the second boy and carry him into shore. At some point, I'm trying to console him, speak to him in, in Spanish, let him know that everything is OK. He can't speak to me, and at some point, he gets sick and passes out in my arms. By the time I reach shore, a crowd has gathered. And among them, thankfully, is a nurse. She's already caring for the first uh, boy and girl that have been brought to shore. 
She helps me bring the second boy into the shade. She has other people helping her so I can turn my attention back to the two swimmers still in the water. The clock is still ticking. As I'm considering whether or not I'm going to have to go back out there, if my luck has run out, finally the Coast Guard arrives. They're driving ATVs, they're carrying their jet skis and life rings and life vests with them. I tell them that we've got three swimmers safely ashore, but there's still two in the water. I point them in the right direction. And just like that, my job was done. In a matter of no time, they've got the two swimmers safely ashore. The clock has stopped ticking. There are no more swimmers in the water. The rest of the morning was a blur. The crowd had gathered. The nurse continued caring for all the swimmers. More ATVs would arrive, and soon the Coast Guard was preparing to take all the swimmers to the hospital. I saw the birder and his partner walking away, and we caught each other's eyes. We didn't say anything, but we shook hands and hugged, and then he went on his way. I would never learn his name, but he was so instrumental with the help at that critical moment responsible for saving the lives of those swimmers. And then I thought about my mentor, and I smiled, because I knew that his story had cautioned me. And rather than jumping in the water and swimming, instead I waded out into the shallows and thankfully was able to signal the swimmers in the right direction. That choice, I believe, turned the tide in our favor, and his story was responsible for saving the lives of those five swimmers. It's been months now since the events of that day have unfolded. And still, in the middle of the night, I'll awake to those screams. And I'll see the terror in the faces of those children. And it can still well up the emotion in me that will send chills through my body. In those late nights, I replay the final scene of Playa Escondida over and over again. I've gathered my things. I'm getting ready to leave. I see the girl sitting in the sand, and head in her hands, rocking back and forth, and she's still crying. The two boys that I helped ashore, they're laying back in the shade, but they're awake and drinking water. And crouched next to them is their father. And in his eyes, I see relief. I see gratitude as he slowly gives me a thumbs up and bows his head in thanks. And with that as my final memory of Playa Escondida, I always manage to fall back asleep. That was Jeffrey Shell. Jeffrey is an associate professor of oceanography with Sea Education Association, a renowned study abroad organization offering academic programs in marine environmental studies. His research interests include biogeography of zooplankton communities, ecology of the Sargasso Sea, and revealing the historic context of contemporary conservation issues. Other work interests include snorkeling, hiking to remote waterfalls, and natural history illustration. For more science stories, take a look at storyclatter.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. Also, we depend on listeners like you for our support. If you love the podcast, please consider donating at storycollider.org slash donate. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to The Frontier for hosting the show, to Skylar Bear for producing the event, and to my heater for turning on first go. Thanks for listening.